All right. All right. That's great news. Welcome, everyone, to BC Hornet Sports Roundtable. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to discuss uh, several topics. And if the YouTube stays up, uh, we're hoping that we can um, talk to you and have you ask some questions of the panel here. This is going to be the first time if this works uh, for us tonight. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, tonight's uh, panel consists of Kevin Dieterle, and I got to turn my volume off, don't I? I hear two of everything. There we go. Kevin Dieterle, uh, one of our panelists tonight, uh, regular on this uh, roundtable. Jared Hoots, Aaron Surratt, Steve Surratt, and tonight our guest person standing in for Nick Hindeker. Actually, we invited him before Nick said he couldn't be here. Uh, Casey Ray, coach at Central uh, Camp Point High School and a friend of Kevin Dieterle's and uh, a friend of Coach Hoot. Several of us here have met uh, Casey before. Casey, thanks for coming on board tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, guys, we uh, I sent out some topics out there, and you know what? I had to shut down my window, so somebody else might prompt me on. I know we're going to talk about NFL players. We're going to talk about the draft a little bit, but uh, Casey and uh, uh, Jared, let's talk about what the IHSA brought down today. Uh, yeah, you, um, IHSA finally uh, kind of pulled the plug on spring sports this year. Um, they came down, I think, around noon today. They made an announcement that they're going to uh, cancel all spring activities um, with the hope of maybe in uh, June, what they did is they lifted the restriction as uh, far as um, playing after the state tournament. They canceled the state tournament, but hopefully to get the seniors and some of these kids just a couple games, as long as uh, the uh, gather band is lifted, that we could possibly play a few games um, with some schools, just give them some experience, just give them some time on the field. But once again, it's got to go with uh, what everybody's saying and as far as the government protocol when it comes to that. Um, but I they has rules in place where you can't play past the state tournament, which they've lifted. And they've also uh, said that, um, you know, as of right now, no, the contact days for football are now um, not in play, uh, where you can't have contact, you can't do seven on sevens and stuff like that uh, as of right now until um, more information comes out. So, Casey, how do you think that's going to affect how you guys prepare for this fall? I mean, what changes do you think are going to happen? Uh, well, obviously, we can't get any kids in for any kind of uh, summer workouts until that ban is lifted, and that's always been something I feel like we get a, a lot out of our kids during that time. Uh, we don't necessarily use all the contact days for football specifically. Uh, you know, we typically don't start our football stuff until July, so I don't know. You're, we're still hoping – that we can get in time then. Uh, we've, we've had a few mini camps and a few, you know, real short, maybe 60, 90 minute practices, maybe just four or five of those in June. So those are the things we're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, Coach Dixon today said uh, we should probably start thinking of ways that we can uh, have like a virtual kind of install um, as a way to do that for our kids through huddle and we could send out things to them and get them prepared, at least mentally, uh, what to do. If we can't physically have contact with them or anything that way, you know, you got to use this time to get creative. So that's one way we're trying to look at doing things. Well, and creative has been the word since this thing started. Parents have had to be creative. Teachers have had to be creative. Coaches have been creative. I don't know about you guys, and I, I was going to show it one week. Coach Brad Dixon – uh, had a unique thing that he did. He got got time on the news with what he was doing with the track team. Did anybody else see that out there? Uh, some of the drills and so forth that the kids were videoing and sending in that they clipped together. Yeah. I mean, there's there are some good good stuff out there, and it I don't know. I it uplifted me just watching it, 
And so I think it's things like that that are that are going to be the key here to bring uh, the kid fun back to the sport because they they feel like they've been hammered right now. Aaron, what what's it you know that things looking like over in Champaign with you know with this going on? Yeah, so uh, we just had something on the news the other day. Uh, our, our local CBS, WCIA, uh, is uh, the one that is really kind of the, the sports hub for, for Illini sports. And uh, they had the football strength coach, uh, Lou Hernandez, on, and he was uh, talking about the football team and some of the things that they've been doing. And they, they had some videos that, uh, you know, have shown up on, on Twitter and, and Instagram of, of some of the players doing some of the stuff. Uh, saw one guy doing box jumps on uh, – the garbage cans uh, that we all take down to the curb. Uh, he said, I think he said it's like a 45 inch box jump. Um, Josh after baby, the wide receiver, he's just an absolute physical freak of nature. Uh, just I could do that in my him. dreams. <laughs> I, I don't think I can even do that in my dreams. Uh, I don't think I could do that. If you gave me a, a three foot spot, um, but, but uh, they're doing that and they, they showed some guys, you know, pushing some vehicles around Um one pretty good size SUV that was that was pretty good, um, and I think uh, I think your matter baby also had um, he had two ca- case of water on each side, uh, each shoulder, doing some lunges uh, down his driveway. Uh, so, uh, you know, the f- people just have to be creative and use what you have at home, and uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be traditional to be effective. In fact, some of the most untraditional things are the most effective things because they'll use different muscles and develop things a little bit differently. Anything to add on that, Kevin? Well, I, one thing I have admired about Coach Dixon and Coach Ray in that program for the last few years is, uh, and it's more of a question to Coach Ray, uh, you guys do a, a national signing day for your eighth graders. Are you guys still going to make that happen this year? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, no. Uh, we're actually not doing that anymore either. That's a long okay. story. It has to do okay. with the IHSA. Okay. Uh, I just threw you under the bus and I didn't know it. No, I don't I don't want to go too far into that. I don't I want to say I don't agree with it. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it had something to do with um we weren't allowed to contact uh, kids that weren't in our high school, even though they were in our junior high. Um, okay. And in, in, in the way that we were doing it. Um I guess you could think of you know, schools that were in bigger cities where they tried to actually go and recruit the younger um, kids that could go to their school, even though they're not in the district at the time. That's what the rule's in place for. So, no, we're not going to do that. This year. <laughs> you mean that happens? That actually happens? Well, oh, I don't know. I mean, if they're in seventh or eighth grade in Central, they're probably going to be in Central in ninth grade. I thought that only happened like at Route High School and all the Catholic schools out there. Yeah, I don't know anything about that, but yeah, I don't know. I wish they wouldn't have done it. The kids got really excited for it. Um, they got to put a jersey on and all that stuff. The parents really enjoyed it, and and we got a lot more kids out because of it, I think. Um, but yeah, we don't do that anymore. It's a big deal. Again, bureaucracy takes the air out of the sails of people that are just trying to lift kids up i mean your intent i I, and that's where rules get in the problems with interpretation you gotta look at intent what was the intent the intent was to lift the football program up in a small school the intent was not to recruit now like you said places like chicago where districts overlap and things happen yeah i could see where that would be a, a big deal but uh yeah i think that that word recruit that you're using there at a small school, and these guys know better than I do because I don't coach high school athletics, but you're always recruiting your own kids. You you have to have the 60 kids per class or 50 kids per class participate to, you know, as many as possible uh, to to have success. Uh, even at 1A, you know, uh, Illinois high school football, basketball, baseball, you have – I mean, they're recruiting no matter how you look at it. But uh, I, I didn't know that rule, and I think it's ridiculous. And – I always got pumped up to, to see that stuff on Twitter. So I can only imagine what it was doing for, for your, uh, your eighth graders coming up through the system. And uh, I'm really bummed to hear that. I mean, yeah, coach, coach always did a nice job with it, you know, coming up with ways to get more kids. And like you said, you're always recruiting anyway. So 
we always felt like we could get to them um, if they were in eighth grade and we could maybe get a couple kids, you know. So, like, we have junior high football and we have junior high baseball at the same time. And we want to use that opportunity as a chance to tell kids just because you didn't play junior high football and you played junior high baseball, you know, there's a spot for you. Definitely. We've had a lot of great players that didn't even play junior high football. And so we don't really get that chance this spring hardly at all. You know, you can meet with the kids um, as a way to, you know, you can meet with them in a kind of freshman orientation kind of manner. That There's different ways to do it right, uh, just not that way anymore. But, yeah, it's it, you're always recruiting. So um, whether they're in ninth, 10th, 11th grade, you're trying to get that big kid out of the hallway and then onto your team, you know. In any kid, really. You know, if, we're, we're try, if we try to get 20 freshmen, that's a great year for us. That's, that'd be unbelievable. You know, we can end up with 10 to 12 of them playing still as seniors, then I think that's great. Particularly with the downtrend in football. I mean, you've got to be creative to get kids out for football these days. The days of just being able to say, hey, we've got a great program and walking 50 people out on the, on the field and you've got 200 or less in your high school are gone. Uh, you have to be creative. And, and I think football in a lot of ways uh, – has gotten a bad rap uh, due to concussions, due to a lot of different things. I mean, I've talked to a lot of football players, said if I've got memory problems, it's not from concussions that I had in football. It's that I work construction and I hit my head umpteen times, you know, not ducking when I came through a doorway or something that I was supposed to do. I've done a lot more things in life to give me concussion protocol than being hit in a football game. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people misunderestimate, you know, like with football, it really has the best chance to get the most people on the field at one time. I mean, because if you think about basketball, I mean, you're probably going eight deep. If you're going more than eight deep, either you're really talented or you're really bad. Um, and with football, I mean, maybe you're just on the special teams, but you're going to see the field or maybe you're just an offensive a player, you know, I know, you know, Coach Ray will probably attest that their nice run last year is because they have multiple guys that they could wear down normal 1A teams where they could play one line on offense and another line on defense. And that that was great for them last year to be able to do that, you know, and, and as far as, uh, you know, recruiting the hallways, I think you have to at almost any sport anymore, you know. I mean, if you think just going off of football to basketball, I mean, how many – full JV teams have you seen in basketball the last few years? I mean, you hardly ever see a small school have a freshman basketball team anymore. You know, you have to go to Quincy, maybe JHS to find a true freshman basketball team, you know? So I think coaches anymore are always recruiting, you know, it helps a lot. Like I know for us that all the coaches are involved in getting everybody to play all three sports. And I know, you know, you guys over at Camp Point do the same thing. You know, it helps tremendously where we're not having to pick and choose athletes you know, to come out there because we're fighting the battle as it is, just trying to get good kids to come out to play. Aaron, what's the participation like over in Champaign? I know you're not connected with the high schools, but you've got kids in junior high. What have you seen? Are they able to field like full seventh grade teams, full eighth grade teams? And are the, what's their struggle? Uh, so, I mean, I think, I think your bigger school districts um, aren't, aren't having challenges with like seventh and eighth grade teams. Um, you know, I think a lot of it, a lot of it has to depend on, you know, the culture of your, of your school, um, you know, and what the, you know, it, it, in some ways it's, it's kind of uh, sad that if a team's not successful, you're, you're less likely to get, you know, an athlete who, you know, is kind of on the fence to come out versus if you're, you know, got a strong program, you're more likely to see that kid, I think, come out. Um, but, you know, even some of the smaller uh, junior highs and middle schools are fielding full basketball teams, uh, at least. Um, now, some of the really small, my kids go to a pretty small private school, and so we have a lot of uh, seventh graders playing on eighth grade teams. Um, but, um, you know, that that isn't necessarily a bad thing either because those kids get to, you know, learn different roles um, and get to, you know, get to learn what it's like to be maybe a leader on a seventh grade team, and but maybe how to, to take, you know, a, a smaller role on a, a team that they're playing up with. I, and I go back several years. We didn't have that problem. Uh, Triopia in the mid seventies for basketball. We were not a basketball school, but we, Coach Camp had 500 basketball victories. Most people did not know that. He's known for his football, but he had 500 basketball victories. And we had a freshman team because I can remember coming to Brown County and playing in the Nest, 
when I was a freshman. We had our JV team. We had our varsity team. We played plenty of tournaments where the freshmen, if you get, got, get the people out, the opportunities to play become so much bigger. And kids don't understand that. You may be, you know, the sixth or seventh person on, person on the freshman team, but if there's enough freshman teams around, we're going to have freshman tournaments. You're going to have freshman games. And, and I think that's the struggle that some kids see is where's my opportunity as opposed, well, I'm not going to play much. They don't look for the opportunity. They look at the reason, you know, why they're not going to start. We kind of talked about that last week, that instant gratification that they want to, as a freshman, want to be playing varsity and want to be playing now and got that attitude because we've had smaller numbers. Thoughts? Well, I think there's two, two thought, schools of thought there. It's, it's either you're looking for excuses or you're looking for opportunities. And those kids who are looking for excuses are going to be able to find them. And those kids who are looking for opportunities are going to be able to find them too. So I think it's about the, the mindset of the, the individual, about the mindset uh, you know, that the, the family has instilled, and about the mindset of, of the coaches. Again, if you've got a good program with good tradition and good coaches who you know, can, can show kids, hey, you know, I, I can find a place for you. I can find a way for you to contribute. Um, you know, that's a lot of that's a lot of it's culture. And just like, just like you said, and I mean, obviously I'm sure all of us watched the, uh, Jordan thing on Sunday and can't wait for next Sunday. Uh, but you know, I mean, how many times, you know, kid nowadays that won't make a team go back out, you know, I mean, look at all the examples that, that obviously we're talking about Michael Jordan here, but I mean, everybody, I can, I can give you numerous examples of kids that I've coached that maybe weren't the best junior high players that turned out to be the best high school players and maybe people that were the best junior high players stopped working because they maybe matured faster and stuff like, or whatever may have happened in that situation. But, you know, and I think culture has a lot to do with it, you know, nowadays, um, you know, obviously, you know, parental involvement is a huge thing anymore um, that a lot of people deal with, uh, with that. And, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a numerous, but I think at the end of the day, if a kid wants to play and I'm sure all of us here have played for coaches that, you know, we didn't probably agree everything that they did, but we played because we loved the game, you know, uh, with that anyway. I know for me, for example, that, you know, there's a few people that I didn't enjoy playing for, but I played because like, I love playing basketball. I played basketball, baseball, and football. Okay. Anybody got something else? Casey? Um, I, just, I just think for a lot of kids – in high school, it, a lot of them get nervous about committing that much time. Um, and so, you know, they see us, they see us working pretty hard, you know, three days a week in the summer and they start to wonder, can I do all that? You know, can I go, can I go through football camp? You know, what am I really signing up for? And you got to really try to ease their mind in that. You, know, you got to try to let them know you got a chance to be a part of something. Um, that is a hell of a lot of fun. And they don't really see it at first. And so what you try to do is, you know, as coaches, you got to find a way. And it sounds corny, but you do have to find a way to make things fun to be on a team. Um, and it's not just about winning and losing. It sure as heck hopes – or, sorry, sure as heck helps if you win. Um, and you start to see more people out. But, you know, it, it all starts from the lower levels. For I, I coached junior high basketball for, let's see, this is my first year I didn't do it since 07. And so, um, you know, in junior high, transitioning up to high school, you start to see those kids that Coach Hoops is talking about. And so even, even when you're a freshman or a sophomore at Central, you're going to see time on the JV game. You're just going to see it either there or on the freshman field. And we want to give you the chance to play because we want you to be a part of our program. And so I think you just have to be careful um, as a youth coach, junior high coach, you want to keep those kids involved and you really don't want to discourage them too soon. You know, one example, Coach Hoots, you know, I had a player, Zach Hibbert was his name. He ended up going to play at McMurray. And he was a tall, lanky kid in junior high, really not very good, you know, but he was – very tall and he was starting to get better and get better and better. And by the time he graduated, he was, you know, a six, four, two guard, you know, he was a hell of a player. And so uh, you just never know. You really do never know what's going to happen. So you got to give those kids a chance. And I think a lot of times uh, we get caught up in winning and losing 
you know, those lower level games and you got to really watch yourself and start thinking about what the bigger picture is for a lot of these kids. Yeah. Do you think, I'll ask this of each of you can give you an opinion on this. Do you think we've taken the fun out of it? You talk about kids and the commitment to do it. And again, I'm going to relate things to 50 years ago. Okay. Because I, being 62 years old, I have watched things progress. I had baseball season in the summer, had my little league, had my stuff there. When that got over with, when I was in high school, yeah, I'd think about doing weights and getting in shape for going to football. But I stayed in shape during the summer, you know, playing baseball and doing my thing there, maybe doing some basketball at home. Then football season came into play, and I was all about football for the whole football season. And when football was done, we were into basketball. And I had my season, so it didn't feel like I was playing any sport 12 months out of the year or nine months out of the year. And it seems, in, in my opinion, in today's age, we're asking kids to make a nine-month, eight-month commitment to one particular sport. And if they're multi-sports, they've got several people pulling on them all at once. Reactions from you guys. Am I right, wrong, disagree, agree? I, I, I just don't I think. I think it really depends on the school. I think some schools are that way. I think uh, you see different trends at certain schools where one sport tends to override another and you get a, a lot more participation there and you have to commit a lot more time to that program or it's just not going to jive with that coach or the program as a whole. Um, I know at Central we really try not to have that be the case. You know, we haven't we haven't really got our football guys together since after the season, since the banquet. You know, uh, our basketball coach, Coach Barnett, he gives our basketball guys plenty of time off. Uh, you know, after after June, typically the basketball team on a normal year, I don't know about this year, but on a normal year that they've had their shot and that's pretty much it. And then uh, in terms of baseball, Coach Tenhouse, you know, he gets them in the spring. He gets them throwing um, if they want to. And then that's that's really about it. So I think you've really got to work together with your coaches in your district to make sure those sorts of things don't happen. And if you don't have that sort of relationship, you could have those issues where uh, kids start to you know, slide one direction or the other instead of having all these multiple sport athletes, which in, in the long run tend to help people out. You know, it help, tends to help out the the athletes and the school itself. Yeah, I know it's kind of easy for me to talk about, you know, the three sports because I had my hand in all three of them for a long time uh, over here. But, uh, you know, I know as at when I first, you know, you're a young coach and you're first doing it and you want to, you know, get everything in where now the older I am, the more time they need a break. Um, I think a lot of times these kids, uh, need a little bit more time off than they have in the past, it seems like. Um, and what I mean by time off is, is you don't have to work them as hard. I think the big thing anymore is just make sure that they maintain that competitive edge in whatever they're doing, and they're going to come out just fine um, with that. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, you know, I think money's a big aspect anymore because uh, a lot of people pay for a lot of private lessons that uh, probably 10 years ago weren't happening. Yeah. So whether it's baseball, basketball, or, I mean, I know they have seven-on-seven seven leagues up by Chicago now that some people go to. Obviously, we don't throw the ball, so, I mean, we don't need to send any kids up there. But, you know, I think money's involved. And so when money starts getting involved, the parents start getting more involved because they're paying for the success of their kid. Um, and I think a lot of times that over puts a lot of extra pressure on that kid. Um, because if I know mom and dad spent $500 a month to send me to some basketball school, I better be you know, playing basketball. And it takes, I think that takes the fun out of it. Um, you know, I'd rather see a kid that can go up town here and hold his, hold his own against the Josh Babs and the, you know, D Drakes and the Tanner Susan box of the world up here in Brown County. And, and they're going to be okay instead of going to some camp in my eyes, because, you know, I know they're going to get that competitive edge. They're going to get thrown down a little bit. They're going to have to work a little bit where uh, let's face it anymore. You know, some of those camps you go to, they're just kind of money makers. You know, if you're a good athlete, I'm going to promote you on Twitter because you're scoring 20 points a game 
but maybe that kid that's not a good athlete, maybe you go work with the high school kid I hired and you go do layups for about a half an hour and I'm going to take the money. <laughs> you know, I think, I think that has a lot to do with things anymore with the money aspect. And I think uh, the pressure, um, and obviously social media has a lot to do with it too because everybody wants to post how good little Johnny does, you know, in, in certain events. Aaron, Kevin, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm right down the middle, to be honest with you. I think in, in small school uh, America, I don't think we have the problem. I, I, you know, I think that the coaches do a good job um, from the get-go. I think that, um, yeah, there, there's parents uh, like myself who get sucked into, hey, uh, we want to play 19 travel ball tournaments, uh, you know, and you put your kid on a team and you think you know what's best for them. And um, I, there's parents like me you know, and I've learned my lesson. And so, you know, trying to, to figure that out as a parent uh, is just as hard as it is as a coach, I, you know, and these guys know that uh, they, they're both parents, uh, Aaron's parent, you know, it's, it's tough. It, this day and age, it's really easy to see, hey, my kid's got a crazy talent in this sport right now at the age of eight, and I'm going to put everything I have into it. And a lot of people do that. Um, but the teams that, 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 that I see right now uh, that Colin plays with, all those kids are still in basketball. You know, they're playing basketball, they're playing football, they're playing baseball. So small school, rural Illinois, I don't think it's a problem, but I think that um, the more money you throw at it, uh, you know, the more the parents get involved, like Coach Hoot said, uh, I think you go down that rat hole that, that you don't come back out of. Okay. Aaron? Yeah, I, I think – you know, I think the biggest difference, uh, you know, I'm, I don't feel like I'm that old, but, uh, you know, the difference between even when I was, uh, you know, in, in high school or, or junior high is just the, the, at least from where I sit, the, the travel ball and the AAU teams stuff, I don't feel like that existed, at least not in the same way that it does now. Uh, and in some ways that's great because if a kid loves baseball and wants to play a heck of a lot of baseball, you know, they've got the opportunity to do that now where maybe they, you know, when I was a kid, we, we had Little League in the summer. And that was, that was it. Um, you know, but now kids can, can get a lot of ball in if they, they want to do that. And, you know, as a parent, um, you know, and again, my, my oldest one is going to be in middle school next year. Um, so I'm not quite there yet with, with some of this, but, you know, as we've gone to the Cardinals caravan over in, in Champaign a couple of times and, and dad was there with us uh, this year. And, you know, I think it was, I think it was Tom Lawless. Uh, somebody was asking him uh, if you remember he, I mean, Cardinal Sims, remember, he's the one that uh, has the one of the greatest bat flips of all time back in like 87 uh, before bat flips were a thing uh, in that. In the he was colorful. Room. Yeah. But one of the things he said was the best thing you can have a kid do is just play a bunch of different sports. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the, the way we're going with things. And um, my youngest, it just annoys me sometimes, but he just seems to be pretty good at everything. <laughs> so we're just trying to have him do a lot of different stuff and not he's a lot like grandpa. Sure. Yeah. We'll call it that. Um, so we just try to have them do a lot of different stuff. Uh, but the middle one, uh, my, my middle girl is, uh, she loves gymnastics and that's her thing. And she's got, you know, some skill there, you know, so right now we're going to let her do that because she likes it and she loves it. And she'd rather be at the gym. She told us a couple of times, she'd rather be at the gym eight hours a day, five days a week and go to school three hours a day, three times a week than the other way around. Um, we're not going to let her do that, but Sarah Hoots would love this girl, but, but gymnastics is what she loves. So, <laughs> so that's what we're going to let her do right now. And, but we're still going to have her do swimming in the summer, uh, to get something different. And, you know, she's going to get some of that other stuff at school and, and, and PE. So I think, I think you just have to listen to your kids and, and be smart. Yeah. And I, I, the point that I took out of that from you guys is not seen as much from the schools today as we are maybe from the parents, you know, that they've invested a lot of money. And the question is, are they asking their kids, is this what I want to do? Is this what I want to be involved with? You know, and, and Kevin, you made a great comment. You said, if Colin came to you and said, I'm done playing baseball, I don't want to play baseball anymore, or I don't want to play travel ball anymore, you're okay with it. You yeah. know, that was one of the great comments that I've heard from, from parents. And we have to be like that. Is If the kid's excited about it, let them be excited about it. Uh, I can tell you, I wasn't pleased about this, but Aaron started out playing freshman football. He really didn't like freshman football. I did not. 
he, he, he was a baseball guy, played some basketball, broke his arm and said, dad, I really don't want to go back. And my answer was, That's I'm fine. okay. With it. That's fine. And, and there are parents out there that are living their childhood through their kids. Uh, unfortunately, yep. and the kids are, are not us. Okay. Let's, let's go to one of the national topics that, that we had. This will be kind of interesting. Um, Let's talk about the NFL draft a little bit. That's coming up on Thursday. There's a lot of things being thrown out there. Um, who wants to start? Got any comments on the draft? Well, I'll start. So because I don't have the most expertise, uh, Coach Ray and Coach Hoots and everybody else can throw in here. Uh, I kind of broke my the, the way my NFL draft uh, is going to look. I kind of broke it out as the best quarterback, obviously, for me, that's Joe Burrow. Uh, I think he's an impact player year two, if not um, year one. He can move around. He's he's that hybrid quarterback. Um, I I broke it down as uh, Chase Young, obviously the best defender. Uh, he can play that outside uh, that end, or I think he's probably um, you know he can play into those backer positions. He's just a hybrid linebacker, uh, freak of nature. My biggest question in the draft is Tua. Um, I'm not even going to try to say his name. Uh, Tagovailoa, I believe that's how you say it. But um, I think he's the best all-around athlete uh, as far as quarterbacks go in this draft. I think that uh, he doesn't move as well as some people think he does. He can't escape an SEC defender. Um, they're the fastest in, in college football. Uh, so they're going to be just as fast in the NFL. So if you can't do that, um, you're not going to have very much success or you have to change your game. Uh, he's not a great pocket passer either. So, um, you know, also very injury prone, had some hip stuff going on um, that uh, ended his season early this year. And then for me, the best running back uh, is uh, another big 10 guy, Jonathan Taylor, um, 5'11 banger. Um, you know, those Wisconsin running backs to me are just, uh, you know, he's not a Ron Dane by any means or Ron Dane would just run you over, but uh, he's kind of, uh, in the middle he he can he can get outside but uh he's also not afraid to lower his shoulder so uh that's that's kind of how i broke my nfl draft down i think it'll be interesting it's obviously all going to be done the same way uh we're, we're doing this uh facebook live deal here so um it'll be unprecedented okay so who's next i'll just say i'm excited to have some sorry sorry Go ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. I'm just excited to have some real sports to talk about uh, something instead of uh, just not to go me wrong. I really, really did enjoy listening to the replay of the Cubs Cardinals game on Camel X on, on Sunday. It was one of my favorite games from the 2011 season uh, when, when our good buddy Carlos Marmol had a walk off wild pitch. So the Cardinals <laughs> could win. Uh, I was, I listened for about 15 minutes. And I was like, I think this is the game where Marmol had the walk off wild pitch. And sure enough, uh, about, about 20 minutes later, I got to listen to that, and that was that was fun. So I'm excited to have uh, some real sports to, to talk about uh, instead of just a bunch of speculation or rehash of, of old things. Um, and I think I think the most fascinating part is is the Tua question. Where does he go? Who does he end up with? Who's willing to take that risk on the hip? Um, so I think I saw one, uh, Peter King, the, the national sports writer at East Right for Sports Illustrated, thinks that uh, – there's a chance that Patriots trade up and get to a, to replace Tom Brady long-term because uh, you know, that's him dropping is, is about the best chance they're going to have to get a quarterback. You know, that's, that's got that kind of skill. There's clearly the injury risk. That's why you can get him there, but probably the best quarterback they can get for the cheapest price at a young age. So that, that would be an interesting place for him to go too. They're actually talking about him dropping as low as 13 mm -hmm. in this draft. And uh, some other people stepping up that Justin Herbert from Oregon actually being a better quarterback in a lot of the scouts' eyes, overall injuries and everything else. Coach Ray, got any? I, if I could say, I'd say one thing. I, I'm not a big believer in Tua as a pro. I'm just not. I'm selling him. I'm, I, I don't think I would draft him. Um, I would draft Joe Burrow, uh, number one. And I, I think they're going to. And mm -hmm. I think he's going to be really, really good. Um, he can make all the throws. The one question I have about him is 
um, his receivers relative to their competition were amazing. I mean, he had really, really, really great receivers. And I get it, you know, they won the title and they scored all those points against some really good defensive backs. Um, but, you know, are they going to be that much better than the DBs in the NFL? Because when you go from the college game to the pro game, that's where, in my opinion, the difference is. You get defensive backs in the pro game that are really just unbelievable athletes. Um, they could play almost anywhere on the field if you ask them to. Um, along those same lines, I, I was just looking this up. I forgot about the corner from Ohio State, uh, Okuda. He's, he's a freak. Um, he is unreal. And I, I see this mock draft has him going number three to the Lions, uh, to Patricia, and that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I, and I know the Lions are still the Lions. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, before we went live, I, I watched the Patriots a lot uh, throughout the season. I wouldn't necessarily call myself a Pats fan, a Pats fan but um, – I believe in Patricia over there, Detroit, and if, if he's got a chance to sure up that defense, he's going to do it. Um, other than that, that that linebacker from Clemson, uh, Simmons, is also a bad, bad dude. So um, the more the game gets to be where linebackers have to cover, run, blitz, do all these different things, uh, speed is a big – big issue and he, he's a guy that can play fast and he's huge he's big enough anyway and then one other guy that that wasn't really high I mean kind of I guess as a receiver uh, is Judy from Alabama and watching him play and just how fast he is and how fast all those guys are that's that's where the game is headed um, I know somebody was joking um, Andy Reid was looking at some, and I can't remember the receiver now, but you think about the Chiefs and how fast every one of their receivers are uh, using, you know, Tyree Kill is kind of the prototype there. And if, if he can get his hands on a fast guy, I, I know he's not going to fall to the Chiefs, but the comment is just receivers right now, they don't have to be the big 6'5", uh, post up, throw it up high to him anymore. That's not the way offenses are running. And so you see a guy like Judy, uh, that, like this projection has him going to San Francisco. That'd be awfully dangerous on that team. They already have some speed demons. So uh, that's where I'm at on the draft. I, what's interesting is a high school football coach, you really don't get to watch that much um, Saturday football games, not as much as you'd like to. So that's when I get a lot of work done. And so – uh, the only time I really get a watch are, you know, like the, the guys I mentioned, I only watch play because they're in the playoff. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not the, the best uh, NCAA scout, but I've seen those guys play and um, I would take them. And again, I'm selling to it. The, the, the wide receiver you're talking about, they've got him going as high as 11th. He's in that 11th to 15th and thinking that, you know, you look at past drafts, and the real stars have come out sometimes below the top ten because the expectations are so high on that top ten people. And I looked at the draft, and I'm looking at that running backs. Boy, this is a bad year for running backs. You know? Yeah. There, there's nobody in the top 20 that's going to get drafted as a running back by any draft that I've seen. I, I think running. They found out running backs are a dime a dozen. You can get a running back in the third round just as uh, amazing as. I mean, maybe not like a Zeke Elliott. You know, he he's probably a legitimate first round running back. But they they put so many uh, resources into getting him. You know, a lot of teams out there don't want to spend that money, and they can go get a guy in the fourth or fifth round. Well, I think. Oh, go ahead. And I'm looking at my Redskins, and that's kind of how I looked at the draft. You know, the draft in two. If you look at it last year, we didn't have a problem putting points on the board. We had a problem keeping points off the board. I mean, you look, we played with a lot of teams last year, but couldn't play third and fourth quarter because we couldn't play defense. And so for them to move and, and to draft Chase Young, you know, uh, as an edge player, 
you've got to have that pass rusher. You've got to have that person from the outside. And I, I'm looking at them for, for my prospect as a Redskins fan. I think they're drafting pretty good there. I think they're getting the best athlete available. Go ahead, Aaron. I interrupted you. Oh, you're fine. Uh, you know, I, th I think back to the running back thing for just a second. I think the, the reality is that it, with a lot of the coaches that we have now, uh, it seems like a lot of head coaches tend to be from the offensive side because that's where, where you know, the, the rules have shifted uh, the game is you got to be able to put points on the board. Um, and, you know, when, when you have a star running back like Zeke, uh, and that's, that's great, but if, if he goes down or he comes in out of shape because he was holding out in training camp, uh, you know, it's, it's better to have two or three guys that you can put out there that can do different things um, and, and save money to put into your offensive line, your defensive line, your defensive backfield. Um, I think that's the other thing that, that the NFL has shown is if you can find guys with different skill sets you can use in different ways and save money, that's a better use of your, you know, roster construction dollars. Okay. I think – Looking at the draft, I agree with Coach Ray there, the Simpson kid out of Clemson. I think he's going to be, you know, along with Ohio State, uh, Chase Young, probably the second best defender coming just because of his speed and size like you were talking about and can cover. But I think just looking at a team, uh, the next two years, I saw something on ESPN today that the Dolphins has 13 picks in the next two years. I think oh. it's what they got right now. So um, they said that they can make a huge splash this year. Uh, if they because they just traded they got some defensive guys they got but they thought if they could spend money on a quarterback and at least get two wide receivers in this wide receiver draft class I mean they could make some huge strides and then I want to say that they have six of the top 90 picks in the next three years if that sounds right I don't know but I know they have 13 draft picks in the next two years they can really build something I know their new head coach is a defensive guy so you know they might spend on offense this year and they were talking about maybe taking Tua rolling the dice on him uh, and seeing what happens uh, with that um, but I know Saban said one of the biggest problems that Tua had was that he takes the hit instead of avoids the hit he thinks he's big enough to take him so that would worry me as a uh, GM thinking you know obviously he's got to change his ways but obviously a kid that's been playing for what you know, he's a 22-year-old kid that, that he's got that mentality. It's hard to get him out of that mentality to be a true pocket passer, which would worry me a little bit if I tried to take him. The, the, the interview that I heard with Saban said that there are times when he needs to throw the incomplete pass and be okay with that. Yes. You know, again, not taking the hit, not taking that. And, and I think we've seen that with, you know, the Cam Newtons and some of these guys that have come out of college that have been great running quarterbacks – the knock is, is they haven't figured out when it's okay to take, you know, to take the down away with the incomplete pass, as opposed to opening yourself up to injury. You save that time when it's a tie ball game and you diving over the line and getting the extra yard going to win the ball game for you. It's not about winning four downs here in the second quarter or the third quarter. It's, it's about the end of the ball game. And that's been my, my thing with NFL college quarterbacks coming into the NFL you got to have the smarts to know when when to roll the dice and when not to roll the dice and they're so in that college mentality that every yard that we get everything that we need to go is is full bore at this point and they're giving their bodies and everything else up okay any other comments on the draft any draft can be interesting. I lived through the St. Louis Cardinal football era in Bidwell's doing the uh, deal where we've drafted kickers in the first round. And so it, it'll be nice if we have a good solid draft and it'd be interesting to see where Tua goes. I think there's going to be a lot of watching to see how the quarterback things turn out. Number one, number two, pretty solid. Number three, pretty solid. After that, it just depends on, as we see it, you can plan on dominoes falling a certain way, but you're, until you're in that scouting room, it's just like you high school coaches. Until you see them in practice and you look at them in the scheme of your deal, what everybody else thinks you need and do is different than what you even see in your own kids. Okay. The fun ones for me. 
I, I put down, do your court, NFL quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, and defense of, of your all time. We'll start with the guest with Casey Ray with that one. All right. So you're going to have to read them back to me. I'll start with quarterback, quarterback running back. To me, let's start with those two. So quarterback of all time, I think, is Tom Brady. I do. Um, I think second place is a really tough one. Um, if, if I had to give two of them. I think if you watch any of that old film from the 49ers days, Joe Montana was just lights out. Uh, he, he could just – they would, they didn't throw it near as many times as the league does today. And so I'd really love to see him and, you know, and Bill Walsh, honestly, in today's league because uh, that would have been quite something. Um, so anyway, and Peyton Manning would be in that conversation as well. And Drew Brees is working his way up there. Um, he's still fun to watch. Anyway, running back to me is really, really tough. Uh, but I'd say the one that I love to watch the most would be Barry Sanders. Um, I still love watching uh, all those highlights from him. Uh, what was next? What do you have? Receiver? Uh, wide receiver, tight end, and defense. Uh, wide receiver to me, gosh, that's tough. I'm going to say Jerry Rice. I'm going to say Jerry Rice. Uh, I think Randy Moss has got to be in that conversation. Uh, uh, tight end is probably Tony Gonzalez. Um, he was around for so long, never got a chance to win a ring, I don't think, right? I think that's um, correct. Yep. Um, but, but he was a hell of a player and played at a high level for a long time. And what, what was after tight end? Overall defense. Why, uh, I think it's got to be the Bears, doesn't it? 85 Bears. I don't, I don't know how you could say any other team and still live in the state of Illinois. Well, I'm going to disagree with you there, but I'll give, my, <laughs> I, I'll give mine last. Aaron? Oh, man. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, right? Like the, there's, there's the – you know, fan part, uh, there's the who would you build a team around, and there's the who do you just enjoy watching. Um, you know, I think, I think probably the, the best quarterback of all time, um, you know, again, I, I really like Casey's uh, opinion there with Joe Montana. I think with if you put Bill Walsh and Joe Montana in today's game, they would throw for he, – he would have thrown for like 80,000 yards when it was all said and done. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I just – the man never lost a Super Bowl and was just as, as cool and calm as you could ever want a quarterback to be. Um, so as much as I'd love to say Troy Aikman there, uh, I'm going to go with, with Joe Montana. Um, the fan in me does love, love Aikman. Aikman never lost a Super Bowl either. Uh, he was 3-0 in the Super Bowl. Uh, I'm just going to point that out. Um, uh, probably my favorite to watch though would, would be Peyton Manning, uh, just the way he had complete mastery over everything that was happening on the field when he was on there. Uh, and running back, it's kind of the same thing. Um, you know, if you want to just watch somebody play running back, Barry Sanders, I think, is the right answer. Uh, and if you want to build a team from scratch, I think, you know, Jim Brown just would have been the guy that you want to do, just tough as nails and, and ultimate competitor. Um, wide receiver, uh, you know, I think, I think in his prime, just watching him play, I think it's, I think it's Randy Moss. Uh, just nobody else dominated a football game from the wide receiver position like he did. Uh, when he decided, and part of it's the attitude, but when he decided he wanted to play, the man was unstoppable. Um, but I think if I'm going to build a team around a guy who did everything, uh, I sure like Larry Fitzgerald, a guy who gets probably not nearly as much credit uh, in today's game as, as he should because he plays in Arizona where they've had some really, really cruddy teams. Uh, but Larry Fitzgerald is just the, the consummate pros pro who, you know, takes pride in his blocking as well as mentoring and uh, just playing the game right. Uh, tight end. Um, that's tough. There's, there's just a lot of really great tight ends. Um, I think you, you can't go wrong with Tony Gonzalez. That's a good choice. And then uh, overall defense, um, man, the, the Ravens in, in like 2004, I know, I know Ray Lewis may have murdered a guy or two, but, uh, he, he ended some careers on the field too. Uh, Allegedly. But, 
allegedly right allegedly that's why i said may 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 have uh but man that ravens defense they won a super bowl with trent dilfer as a quarterback trent dilfer i'm just gonna let that sit there <laughs> trent dilfer so th- that'd be my picks defense did you say defense the ravens oh ravens yes okay it's trent dilfer <laughs> kevin uh, yeah, real simple for me. Best quarterback, uh, greatest quarterback of all time, Tom Brady. Um, I mean, the guy's just the, the consummate winner. Uh, he comes from a tough, you know, college career where he didn't get to play as much as he probably should have. Um, and every time he did, he won. Uh, you know, so it, it will always be Tom Brady. I, I, Brady, I understand that people say that um, he's a systems quarterback, but I hate to tell you this, but Bill Belichick doesn't win uh, all those Super Bowls uh, without Tom Brady. Um, running back, again, Coach Ray and I, you can tell uh, we grew up together. Barry Sanders, um, I just remember uh, Thanksgivings, you know, um, where you're watching the Lions uh, play the Packers, and that guy's just putting on an absolute show. Um, and he might only get six yards per carry. But it was the funnest six yards you you you, you watched the entire day. So um, that's a simple one for me as well. Uh, tight end, uh, Antonio Gates. So it was probably a little bit of a shocker here, but I think he was one of the first uh, tight ends that I remember watching who was um, could really get up and down the field. Uh, and, and he was kind of that number one receiver uh, at the position. And then, of course, you know, um, coming from a small school, like Kent State, I always like to watch those guys uh, have the success. And he's a first ballot Hall of Famer in my mind. Wide receiver is probably a shocker as well, um, just because it's a lion. I think that Calvin Johnson, uh, a.k.a. Megatron, uh, probably ended his career a little bit too soon um, because in my mind he was probably the best uh, receiver of his time. Um, you know, I didn't get to watch Jerry Rice, uh, but this Calvin Johnson was that – I'm really, really tall. I'm really, really strong, and I can run, you know, a four three forty uh, receiver. Um, and then defensively, I went in a little bit different direction. So I didn't go with the defensive team. I think that's a guarantee that it's the eighty five Bears. Um, but the best defender of all time in my mind uh, is Charles Woodson. Uh, he's a Michigan guy. I love Michigan. He's been to eight Pro Bowls. I think he played for like you know half a century. Um, I know this is a fun fact about him. I looked that up today. Um, you know, he made, he was the defensive player of the year in 1998 and then also in 2009. And I think for a corner, um, to have that length of a career, uh, and to be able to still play at that high of a level, uh, is, uh, to me, makes him the greatest defender of all time. Okay. Coach Hoots. Um, I agree with a lot of the, Statements so far. I think Brady is probably the best. Brady or Montana. Obviously, you go with uh, winning the Super Bowls. Um, I really enjoy watching Patrick Mahomes right now. I think he has a chance to do some special things if he can stay healthy um, and they can keep those weapons around him. Um, Barry Sanders was my running back. Um, Just have those ingrained thoughts, even in his college days, those Oklahoma State where he bounces off like 14 guys and still runs it in for touchdowns. Uh, I had Tony Gonzalez, my tight end. I had Jerry Rice for my receiver. And then uh, defensive player, um, I think probably my favorite defensive player of all time, uh, being a Bears fan, would be Earl Acker. But that's just being a Bears fan. But I think overall, I'm going to have to go with Ronnie Lott, a man that would cut off his own finger so he can play in the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, that's, that's some toughness for you right there. Um, and obviously, the 85 Bears is the best defense uh, ever created by Dick Cow. <laughs> All right. Well, the Jerry Rice, that that's my pick at wide receiver. I just saw him pick defenses. Able when Montana got in trouble to change his routes and be on the same page, and I think that makes a great, great wide receiver also. Is someone who knows what his quarterback's going to do, where he's likely to take off, how can I get open to help him out, or how can I throw a block? And I think we talked last week, not the fastest man on the 40, mm-hmm but definitely had the moves in it. And an NFL wide receiver, I think we put too much on the 40. You know, the people that can think, that can jig and jag and move, you know, and fool the defender and get their feet tangled up is the guy that's going to get the ball because he's going to be wide open. 
Um, Tony Gonzalez, hands down, I think one of the best tight ends out there. I would have went uh, old school, a little further back. I would have went uh, Kellen, Kellen Winslow. Um, and I'll tell you, the Chargers, the teams that he played on were not what I call great teams. Um, defensively, I'm going to show my age. 69, 70, early, late 60s, early 70s, the purple, pe purple people eaters of the Minnesota Vikings with uh, Page, Marshall, Eller, and Larson. I mean, they were nails. And I know you guys were not around. He's running the wrong way. <laughs> okay. That was Marshall, right? You picked yeah. up the fumble and ran the wrong way? Uh, no, that was your Dallas Cowboy guy. Mm -mm. He ran the right way, but he touched that anyway. <laughs> uh, quarterback. A guy, because of where he played, was a quarterback before his time, and I would have really loved to have seen him in this offense this day, Dan Fouts. Chargers, not one of my favorite teams, but Dan Phelps – Fouts threw for 4,000 yards three or four straight years in a row. I mean, you look at a time, passing was not the game in his era. But Coriel brought in Eric Coriel, and they put it out there. And he did it with, I don't think one of, you know, I could look at some receivers that I would have loved to put around him and see what he'd do in this, this era. And, and I think Coriel was a man before his time. My running back reminded me of pinball machines. You know how the ball just bounces off, how, the, how it bounces off the bumper on the pinball machines? Well, my guy was Earl Campbell. I mean, that guy was a brick. When he ran through a hole and he hit somebody, they knew he hit them, and sometimes he, they would bounce off of him like a pinball thing, and he got some of the toughest yardage, but I mean could run the football. True ground game guy. So those are my old school guys that I throw in just because I'm old and just because I can remember uh, them play, playing ball. Lots of good defenses. I mean, as I, I looked up the Steel Curtain in Pittsburgh, uh, the, your Bears defense, um, the Rams had an era. And there was an era in there in the 60s and 70s where you had some really solid defensive football teams. So those are my picks. Anybody got anything else you want to throw out now that everybody's had a chance to? I would say the one thing that we didn't think about was maybe a running back that, that was multifaceted. Uh, and this is kind of a homer pick, but I mean, you can put Marshall Falk in pretty much any offense and that man would have been successful, whether it was a passing offense or a running offense. Um, so I, I love me some Marshall Falk. Who's the guy that Montana used and Young used out of the backfield? Roger Craig. Roger Craig, yep. yep. Yeah. I mean, you look back, at, there's been some really good, solid citizen, uh, you know, football players that, that have come out that, you know, I'd love to have the kids see the film on, you know, like your Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders is exciting. I totally agree with you. I mean – there are times when he got through a hole before I think the hole was there. He was that quick and hit the, hit the hole that fast. Well, sometimes the hole was two people to the right, even though it wasn't supposed to be there and he got there anyway. That was, that was the exciting part for me. Yeah. Run, the run to daylight. Casey, you'd love for your backs to be able to do that. Wouldn't you? Oh run yeah. Daylight and uh, run for it. Oh yeah. Uh, one thing I was thinking of uh, maybe the best virtual running back, of all time, it's got to be <laughs> Bo Jackson in Texas. <laughs> it's, not even close. it's not even close. So, if you can get the old Tecmo Bowl from '87 and put it in the old NES, fire that sucker up and be the Raiders. <laughs> Just look out for Lawrence Taylor. Yeah. yeah. If we're going to go virtual, then you got to get Mike Vick from Madden 2005. That man was ridiculous. It was a he was a human cheat code. Oh wow. Well, guys, it's been another fun night. And the great part is we were on Facebook. We didn't get any comments from people. Had several people watching tonight. We're glad that they could join us and uh, do that. And uh, I'm glad that we got it on Facebook. 
I'm thankful for you guys. Casey, thanks for coming in tonight, pinch hinting and, and coming in. You're welcome to come back at any time if you'd like to. Um, hopefully one of these days, like Aaron said, it's nice to be able to talk about the draft because it's something that's actually going to happen. Um, you know, we're going to continually throw in, pick your favorite team and player and things like that to keep things going because what I want to do with those things is uh, cause comments for people even in their own homes, disagreements between their own homes. They've listened to our picks and going, but crap, Hoots doesn't know anything. He, you know, he's forgetting he's about there. this guy, you know, or, or what does Dieterly know? Or goodness gracious, how old is Surratt? You know, I, I want <laughs> those comments to happen because we're living in a time when conversations in the household are actually happening. And uh, um, close out. In the pandemic, what's the most fun thing you've done with your kids in this pandemic that you wouldn't have done if it hadn't happened? Man, that is tough. Uh, I don't know. If you'd asked me like 14 days ago, I'd been much more upbeat about this. And, uh, Are you wore out, Casey? Oh, no, no, no. We're good to go. Uh, no. Seven, five, and one in the same house during this whole time. It's okay. It's fine. Uh, we've had Aaron's a lot of wrestling. Have, Aaron doesn't have it so bad. No, Seven, we've had a lot of wrestling matches and things like that. You know, I think it just gives you time to spend um, enough quality time with each <laughs> one of them uh, as opposed to, you know, getting home at four or five, depending on the time of year. And, and you can't really give them all the same amount of attention that you feel like you need to. So, it's been nice to just be around them that way. Uh, we have played a lot of uh, WWE on PlayStation, so that's been a lot of fun. I'd probably say that. A lot of SmackDown going on. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, uh, yeah, going off that, uh, we played some Madden, and the boys are good enough at that age where they can play on the same team. Well, they were beating the snot out of me, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was getting frustrated. They put mine on – all-star or the all they were <laughs> yep. getting, I was getting so mad and I couldn't figure out what was going on and we about lost the PlayStation because of it because I was getting mad. <laughs> but yeah they pulled one over on old dad so okay I think uh for me it's um so we uh we took an old uh charcoal grill that we had upgraded from and uh, we kind of turned it into a fire pit and uh, watching my, my two youngest uh, be little versions of, of the pyromaniac that I might have been in a different life, uh, taking the hot ash from yesterday's fire and building a new, new one uh, just because they can. Uh, and watching them do that and just get, get excited about that. That's been fun. Okay. Kevin? Yeah, same, same thing uh, as Coach Hoots and Coach Ray. We, Colin and I played a, a little Madden, uh, the new Madden. So to me, that's super new because – I haven't played video games in a few years and uh, we started off on the same team and, and we were loving it and all oh, this is real fun. We're beating the computer and then we played one game against each other and uh, we decided that sh probably shouldn't happen anymore. I decided that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't imagine it's... why. I, I've seen lots of, a lot of good posts from, from people and I call it mousetrap. Uh, somebody thought of it as dominoes. Anybody remember the old game mousetrap where you built the mousetrap and Things had oh, to yeah. happen. The balls had. Some of the things on YouTube that these get, parents are doing with their kids that are building these mouse traps out of toilet paper and golf balls and all this stuff, I think is absolutely great. I can't imagine how long that it took them to build some of this stuff because you're not talking about one room. One of them, I saw a roll of toilet paper starts rolling, hits another roll, it goes down a pole, starts something else. And the ending thing is rolling out of toilet paper, which in this time, goodness gracious, somebody needed the toilet paper, but they were using it for other stuff. But uh, I'm glad to see you guys are enjoying and, and Coach Ray, take care of yourself in those uh, tra trampoline uh, wrestling matches. I'm sure Aaron's had a few of those uh, on, the, on the trampoline. Don't get yep. hurt yourself. Right, that's <laughs> the dangerous part. <laughs> Stay healthy. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get together, uh, at least the four of us. And if Nick doesn't show up, we'll figure out who's going to or who we're going to have to replace him uh, next week. But uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks to our audience out there for being a part of it. We hope you enjoyed it. If you've got questions, 
that you need answered by people who probably don't have the answer, send it to us. Well, we can come up with an answer. We'll make up something at this point. <laughs> but uh, thanks for joining us. Guys, thanks for being on tonight. Yep. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you.